good to see you here this morning, even though it's a rainy morning. I got here uh, 6, no, 7.35, 6 o'clock. I didn't get here at 6 o'clock. Uh, I got here about 7.45 or whatever, and I just looked down. I was like, man, it's going to be a good day. I know it was raining. I know it's a little bit chilly, but it's just a beautiful weekend, a beautiful day. And today is the Lord's Day. So we get to come together as the church. We get to worship together. We get to have this time together, celebrate life together. It's a good day. It's a good day. And I hope you are excited about it. So we're going to jump into it. Today we've been, we're going to continue on a series where we're focusing on the church and the church family. Two weeks ago we talked about how the church is set apart. It is set apart. And it is so because it's God's church. And God calls his people to be holy, which means they are set apart. Why? Because he is holy. But there was a really special element of that, and that was the realization that the church, the people, the people, they are the people with whom God dwells. And so they're very, very set apart, especially in comparison to worldliness. We then talked about how the church stands up. The church must stand up for God. They're distinct in the way that they must stand up. They must speak where God wants us to speak, and we must stand together, uh, is what we're talking about today as a collective body of Christians, it's so important that we stand together. Listen, one of the ways we do that is first, we're going to talk about the way that God appreciates and the way that God has a deep, deep appreciation and love for the church. We need to reflect that ourselves. That needs to sit in our hearts as well. Not just the structure of the church, but also the people in the church, each individually, loved and cared for by one another. So we have to look at that uh, internally as well. I'm going to reveal something about myself. It's not going to surprise you when I say that I love nature and being in nature. So when we look at this picture uh, that's in Vic, Iceland, I love Iceland, haven't been there yet, but seeing this picture really makes me want to go there, not just because it's got one of my favorite singers in the world, not just because it's so tiny, there's like 300,000 people in a land that is maybe just slightly bigger than Indiana itself, not just because they have weird folklore and superstitions. I heard there's a huge majority of them believe there are elves running around. What kind of people is that? I want to have breakfast with those people, that's what kind. But when I look at the landscape, all I can think about is, wow, look at God's creation. Look at the glory of God that is revealed in such a place as Iceland. And when I see that building, which is there for church purposes on some shape, form, or fashion, for sure, I think there in the midst of all that, we can see people with a focus on God to some degree. But then I'm drawn to that wide, vast expanse of the flowers, the wild flowers that exist there. And I got to tell you, I've never revealed this to you before. I love wide expanses of wildflowers. Flowers in a vase, fine, you can keep them. It's all your business, right? But out in the wild, when you see massive fields full of flowers, there's something really, really special about that. It's not just the one flower, which is interesting to look at, but to see all of them collected together, there's something truly beautiful and special about it. And I just want to go be in the midst of it. I'll be cautious looking out for snakes because those are the devil's work. But I will be there with the bees and the bugs appreciating the flowers for sure. They're magnificent. And God gave us beauty in this world. Not to just behold in nature itself, but He gave us beauty in other ways as well. And I think there's a strong correlation, a parallel between the beauty we see in the collective amount of the flowers that exist, and not just the individual, But also the collective community of Christians that exist. There's tremendous beauty in the collective expanse of Christians throughout the world. The people that are joined together in Christ. The people that share the same values because they're God's values. That have the same purpose because it's the purpose God gave them. The people who have meaningfulness in their life because it's found together in Jesus. They share a different kind of love than you would see in the world because it's the kind of love you would see in God. And when you are out and about and you are traveling in a place like Iceland or you're traveling in some other part of America or you're traveling in Indiana and you come across an expanse of Christians that would meet in a local congregation, there's something very beautiful about that. It's God's people and they stand together. They stand together. It's especially beautiful when they stand together in the midst of a time period or a culture or another group of people that may not want them to be there, but they choose to stand together anyhow. 
It's even more beautiful when you know that they might have some internal conflicts because we're humans. And if we're being honest and we get to know each other, some internal conflicts may come up. But, but more important than the conflicts, we're determined to stay together, stand together, to work through it and navigate it because we're God's people. And he's got to be at the forefront of our minds, even in the way that we interact together as his church, even in the midst of our obstacles, our focus has got to be on him. There's something truly beautiful in that. I think God wants us to understand the beauty of the church. He gives us some descriptors of it that help us relate to it in a beautiful way. You might remember a couple weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, we made an allusion to that. And if you want to turn over there, it's a really beautiful thing to read because he's drawing a, an illustration that we, the church, we are the temple of God, the place where he dwells. Let's read that passage real quick. We'll begin there in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 2. He says, Therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. You see, already he's dealing with the standing together aspect. You are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. That's big language, but it's true language. It's real language. You are fellow citizens with the, with the household of God, having built on the foundation of the apostles and the, and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Listen, I love to travel to different places, and I've been to different countries where you can go in and stand in the midst of their temples. They are magnificent for their pagan gods. They're incredible. The massive columns that they build up in tribute to Athena, and the massive expanses of stairs, and the colonnades that you see, and, and the sculptures, and everything that's in the midst of it. And they're devoting that time and that energy, that space, those resources, those rituals that they have that are very complicated. They dedicate all of that in that temple to a God that does not even exist, is not real. This is a way for them to explain their existence. But he says here, he's referencing back to a temple. That the Jewish people would have known where God himself would come and dwell amongst his people. And in that holy of holies, they could have their day of atonement and, and have their sins covered. There was a reality of a God there. And it wasn't the splendor of the gold and the architecture itself because it existed back in the tabernacle itself. The tabernacle, which God gave them in the book of Exodus, the design for, the, the, the materials for. And it wasn't gold and fancy woods and whatever, it was animal skins. But it was beautiful, magnificent, more so than any of the marble temples that existed out in the heathen world, because it was where God came to dwell amongst his people. And now that beautiful sentiment, more than sentiment, that reality that exists in this relational aspect with God exists in the church? Whatever esteem we would give to these magnificent buildings, more so in the gathering of people, the expanse of people who are known as God's people, who live by faith collectively in unity, he says, you are the temple of God. Whatever respect and reverence you would give to a physical thing like that building, how much more so to the collection of people, the fellow citizens of the household of God? He's trying to get us to understand how God designed the thing and how God appreciates it quite deeply. We need to have that as well. Skip over a couple more chapters and you go to Ephesians chapter 5. You for sure, if you've been to a wedding anytime recently, you've probably heard Ephesians chapter 5 read, beginning of verse 22. Now some people tense up now and then because it gets those husband roles and those wives roles, but it's what God's uh, directing here. But really he's talking about Christ in the church, which is what Paul would reference later on in verse 32. But it's that wives submit to your husbands. But on the flip side it's also that husbands love your wives how much? Just as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. He's drawing a parallel that we can recognize. 
if the church would be the bride of Christ, something very, very special, something holy, something worth sacrificing for, a group of people that should be cherished and uplifted and, and given tremendous honor because it's the bride of Christ, the church. We can understand that. We can relate to it. If you've been to a wedding, you probably remember that time in the wedding, as is our tradition in, in America overall, and certainly in this region, that there's going to be a cue. Sometimes it's the, the preacher, whoever's orchestrating the wedding, and they'll say, all rise. And then you know what to do. Everyone stands up. You might get your cameras out, ready for that moment in which if there's an aisle, there's two doors, they'll open up, and there she is, the bride. And what a special moment. Because it doesn't matter if she's got the most plain dress if that's the best she's got, there she is in that moment, and she's beautiful. She's magnificent. She's radiant. She may even have the fanciest designer gown that's ever been created. It doesn't matter. She's still that bride. She's radiant. She's gorgeous. And she's amazing in that moment where she's going to be coming together with her husband, and they're going to be committed to life together. That's a thing that we can all appreciate, and it resonates with us. On the flip side, it's become more popular now for the cameras not only to turn to the bride, but also to the husband, the husband-to-be, because he's going to get that first look at his bride and her wedding gown. Now, maybe I'm being a little bit romantic in the midst of that, but there's a moment. And I remember one in particular that I saw in which this guy, I thought it was so amazing, because he was willing to be so vulnerable in front of people, he didn't care that they were watching. His face got so contorted, he was caught up in the emotional aspect of it. Tears immediately <laughs> rained down. He covered his face. And they were taking pictures of her. They were taking pictures of him. And I was like, what is happening here? I, 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 can't, I can't muster the emotion for that. But he did. So it was amazing. We can see the beauty in that moment. And we cherish it. He was so vulnerable, he allowed that to be, even be posted and said, yeah, I love my wife. She's something truly special. I want people to know I'm willing to be that vulnerable in front of everyone to display that. Kind of beautiful, isn't it? God's using the temple and He's using the bride to display how much the church matters. It's by His design. And there's some real emotions in that. And there's real structure in that. And there's a distinction of something truly beautiful. It's carried out by God's people in the way that they follow that. If you skip over just one more book also written by Paul uh, in Philippians. This is while he's in prison and he's writing to the Christians in Philippi. And he's telling them this, you know, they're going to have obstacles. But it matters so much that they're a church that stands together. And the way they do that matters. And the way they honor the church like God matters. And he's encouraging them in the first chapter of Philippians. He says this, uh, beginning, let your conduct Verse 27, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's a choice. A determination to live worthy of the gospel of Christ. Because you cherish the church so much, the collective body of Christians in which you are a part of, every single individual chooses to walk worthy of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, that's the standing together, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. Your willingness to stand together even in the midst of obstacles and trials which he surely knew about in prison for being a gospel preacher at this time. And they sharing in his sufferings as well. Knowing that adversaries would rise up against them as well. But he's saying you stand together walking worthy of Christ. And if you do that, you're a shining example. Certainly of salvation because when Christ comes again it is the faithful, the church, his bride that he will carry with him to the Father in heaven. But to the adversaries, you are a testimony of the judgment that is coming upon them. Do we believe that? Do we live as if those things matter? It's a challenge for us to be determined to stand together, to stand together. In Acts chapter 5, we see the Christians also standing together in a different circumstance. they got people rising up and, and trying to, to push them down to kind of restrict them from speaking about Jesus. In the latter part of Acts chapter 5, we begin a little bit before verse 40. We can see that the apostles have been preaching and have been teaching. But the religious leaders at that time and in that spot have determined they need to stop. 
So they gather them up and they put them in prison. Well, God is with them. And if God is together with them, then they've got to stay together themselves. There's value in that. There's beauty in that. And so he sends an angel to free them from prison. And he tells them to go back into the temple. You go back out in the public and you begin preaching again. Some may have fallen apart. Some may have walked away and said, it's too dangerous. But those people that stand together as the church, those people that stand together in the faith in Christ, who value the things of God, would stand together with God because God's standing with them. And so they go back out and they begin preaching again. Those religious leaders are determined, where are they? Well, they're out there again. Let's stop them. And they come up with a plot to actually kill them for speaking the truth. Now a sane man comes and he's trying to calm the people down and saying, if it's going to fail, it's going to fail, but let God handle it. So they decide instead they're just going to beat them real good. And when they beat them, again, some Christians may have given up and the church may have split a little bit, but not these people. The faithful, the truly faithful who love the Lord's church and the call and the purpose of God stood together. And I love what they say in verse 40. So they agreed with them. So this is when they, were, they called the apostles and they beat them. They commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. Verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They stood together. They stood together. Acts chapter 4 shows a different kind of standing together with the church. Where it wasn't just because of external forces acting on them collectively, but they knew internally they had to have a lot of care and love for one another. And this is the great beauty of the church for sure. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35, just a couple pages over, we can see that the church is growing and the church has certain needs, but they're there for each other. You've got to truly love and care for one another, get to know each other, and develop those relationships. It may require some sacrificial living, but it matters because the church matters. So you stand together to elevate and lift one another up. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all, nor is there any among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone, <coughs> anyone had need. These were people who were functioning as the church, recognizing they were doing the works of God, recognizing that God was together with them, so they must be together. Not only in just sentiment or in attitude, but even willing to give their goods for the benefit of each other. How beautiful is God's church. I think the scripture is trying to make that very, very clear to us. And so it's worth standing together. It surely recognizes that there will be obstacles internally for sure. Paul writes um, later on in 1 Corinthians there would be obstacles that would come, but we overcome them because of Jesus. And if we keep our sight on Jesus, who was the one who purchased the church with his blood? And if we keep our focus on the um, ethics and morals of Jesus, the way he walked, then we're going to be on a good path. And, and if we, we make sure that we maintain Jesus, Knowing how much he loved us and cared for us, even as he prayed for us in John 17, and as he died for us on the cross, and even as he taught the disciples how to prepare in Jerusalem for the coming of the Spirit so the church could grow and expand, he was always there for us and always will be because he is our Lord. He's our King, Jesus. But when we lose sight of that, we begin to fracture, don't we? And if we fracture on the importance of Jesus, then we fracture on the importance of the church, and it makes it quite difficult to stand together. A thing we have to consider. And how could that possibly happen? Well, like I said, in 1 Corinthians, it happened internally. They were fracturing. There was an internal matter that they allowed to happen. They took the mind off Jesus. They lost sight of the importance of Jesus, and what He believed, and what He taught, and how He lived, and the sacrifice He made, and that He was to reign over us. They let other things reign over them, and they fractured. 
But that element of standing together was not given up so quickly, not by Paul and not by many of the church leaders. I know we've talked about this recently, but I think it's worth repeating multiple times so it gets into us pretty deep. Yes, they had troubles, incredible troubles. In chapter 1 we start to see they had divisions amongst themselves over who converted them. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. And they thought that was a good reason to separate and divide internally. No one on the outside was making this happen. They were doing this to themselves. That's a problem. In chapter 5 we see that they're tolerating sin. So bad was the sin that it wasn't even tolerated by the outside world, the heathens itself. Fracturing them. Chapter 8, they had liberties that they could exist in the faith, but when those liberties became a stumbling block to the faith of someone who was not quite as developed, they didn't heed that or show care for that other person's faith. They continued on and became a stumbling block. Didn't really regard each other with tremendous amount of love. Certainly not in the way that Christ would. And even in chapter 12, they had misguided understanding of the gifts, the spiritual gifts that was given. And they would show hierarchies over who was better because of the nature of their spiritual gifts, forgetting entirely that those gifts all came from the same spirit. They should have been unified in those gifts. But they were broken apart internally. They weren't standing together. I think this is a very, very important chapter, a series of chapters in the Bible because we recognize that Paul viewed standing together as the church is so important, he didn't give up on them. He didn't dismiss them. Not at all. In fact, it was his efforts in visiting them and his letter writing and also that of Titus and Timothy and Apollos and probably others over multiple trips to bring them back together in the Lord. And it was a worthwhile pursuit. You don't cast the church aside so easily, not even one congregation, because it's that beautiful. It's that important to God. It's got to be that important to each one of us. So a multitude of Christians participated in reaching out and helping them stand together. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we know that they did. There was repentance. That was victory. The effort paid off. And that's a thing to remember in standing together. We can also look at Paul when he's talking to the elders in the church in Ephesus. He's been with them some time, three years I think. And he's about to leave. And so he's sending them off as he's about to go to Jerusalem. Now, as he's about to go face a lot of persecution and tribulation in Jerusalem, he wants to meet with these elders. Why? Because the church matters. And they've got to stand together. And he knows that there's going to be troubles for them as well. And so he explains that to them in Acts chapter 20. It's important that they stand together. And so he says this to them. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul was emotionally invested in this congregation. He was spiritually invested in this congregation. And he knew that obstacles were coming on them and that the overseers, the elders of the church needed to stand firm and hold them together. And he was willing to pray for them and he was giving them some encouragement to prepare for it. That's how much it mattered. You can't let it fracture if you stand together in faith. High value for church. Incredibly high value for God's church. Because God defined it that way. And so His people, the children of God, must also have that same value for it. Not just as an intellectual construct, but for the individual people as well. Everyone matters for sure. Now that challenges us as we try to make something practical out of this today is to consider how we fit together. How do we fit together? Because on one hand we hear these stories and we read them in Scripture and they're incredible. I mean they're absolutely incredible. The, the, the struggles that people make and the, they overcome and the efforts that they put in to be there together in the midst of trials and tribulations. And even when they have these victories where 3,000 people are baptized and then later on it seems like seemingly impossible converts take place. The Philippian jailer, how amazing is that story? The Ethiopian eunuch, how amazing is that moment? And the church grows and it gets momentum and it develops. 
I mean, how incredible is it that on Acts chapter 1, before they go into the day of Pentecost, there was only 120 disciples that were gathered. Just 120. And from that 120, on that day of Pentecost, of course the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were going to go out there in the midst of the Roman Empire and in the midst of religious opposition that this would be the church that would overcome. How incredible. And how incredible that over 2,000 years it would lead us to this moment, to this day where we, we would be the Lord's church. Do we truly believe and trust in God's design? That what we read right there is what we are today. God's made it possible, for sure. Jesus paid the price and purchased the church. Every single one of us that have obeyed the gospel, he's added to the church. And when we struggle, we can go to him. He listens to us, for sure. He's given us instructions that, the, that Jesus is the head of the church. The elders oversee the church. That there's ministers who preach and teach, that there's deacons who help in the service of the works of the church, that there's members who all contribute continually. He's given us that structure, and it's pretty clear. Pretty clear. Do we truly believe? Do we truly believe to the point we're willing to commit and put in the effort to make it shine? So that that doesn't look like something that's so exceptional that we're always trying to attain it, but it's our reality each and every day. That's what God wants us to understand in standing together. It's not theory, it's not probability, it's reality. And the reality that they had in the first century is the reality that we have today if we put our faith and trust in God and God's design. And we stand together and we fit together as He gives us the example. It's a choice. He's made it possible. We choose to get on board. Consider, you, if you would, the way we fit together. That's the important part, isn't it? There's a trend and there's a tendency to believe that just one element is all it takes. One block, so to speak. And then if we have the sense that we are simply Christians, that's good. We're the church. That's all it takes, right? Jesus adds to the church. But the problem is, if we think that way, that it's just the one element, and maybe through that one element we come together on Sundays and we worship, that's pretty good, right? It is pretty good. But it's easy to pull apart, and it's pretty loose. It's hard to stand together when you're really not even fit together, and you're barely even coming close to one another. So much more, so much more to the church than that. Over time you may figure out, well listen, we can get closer. And maybe we're involved in worship, and maybe we're studying together, and maybe we're praying together, and maybe we're serving together. And this structure starts forming, and we can see like what he was talking about, uh, being fit together with Jesus as the chief cornerstone in Ephesians chapter 2. We can get a, a sense of that, but it's still pretty loose, isn't it? Maybe we are doing things together, and we're fitting together, but that's pretty easy to topple. We need something more. So we commit a little bit more, and now we see something more complex. We've got some depth to us a little bit here, and we're starting to grow together, and we're starting to engage more together, and we're spending more time together, and we're building something in the church. But still, while it is complex and it's becoming a little bit more pleasing, there's more to it. There's more before we get to that thing that we see in the Bible that's so beautiful. What if we had a next level of depth to where our lives are beginning to get a little intertwined? Those marriages we talked about, we're attending each other's marriages. In fact, you might be helping plan those marriages, or at least the wedding showers, the baby showers. You might be here for the baptisms, and you might be here for the funerals. Something really special is taking place at this point. A structure that's pretty strong is forming. Not easily toppled over. And it's honed and it's shaped by Jesus, because we keep looking to the Word. And it's a choice to be placed in that structure to stand together. You commit to it. You start becoming more and more like family, right? Like family. Most of us don't choose our family for sure. You, you, you're born into your family, but you're often committed to it, right? I'm blessed with coming from a large family. I have 20, 25 uncles and aunts, something like that, not including the ones by marriage. Is that right? 20. Uh, forgive me, whichever uncle and aunt I forgot, right? But I got a lot of cousins. I don't know them all, but they're family. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support them. 
There's some that have various interests. That seems crazy to me, but you know what? They're family. I'm going to support them no matter what. If they get through high school and they're going into the military, yes, I'm going to cheer you on. You go through high school and you're going to go in a career through college, I'm going to cheer you on. You go through a trade school, yes, if that's what's best for you, I will back you up because we're family. That's what's best. And when people come at family, I'm going to stand together with them. We have a family cemetery, and at one point someone came in and decided they were going to take plots from the family cemetery. What? You're not family. Did I support my uncle who went and took up all their, you know, markers, and he put them in the family trash can and said, nope? Yes, of course, because you got to stand with your family. It got no worse than that, I promise, (laughs) that I'll say in public. You stick with family. There's a commitment to make that work. And are there times in which tensions build up because you disagree? Yes. And does it hurt sometimes because someone betrays the family? Ooh, yes. And then divorces take place and then people die and there's real struggles and people move off and you worry about trust, but you still stick together in the midst of it. You forgive and you move forward because you're family. If that exists in that realm, and we can see that level of depth of it there, how much more so for God's family? God's family. Where we choose to be a part of it. Where we choose to commit to it. Where we choose to build up and make it as meaningful as we can possibly contribute to it. Not just one of us as an individual, but every single one matters to come together. A wild expanse of flowers for sure, but quite beautiful, but moving together for the purpose that God gave. There's eventually going to be a time period where you realize, you know what? I'm not a cube. And this is where it really starts to sing. Sometimes we oversimplify it. We think our lives are just these nice, neat cubes, but they're not. There's a lot of color to a lot of your lives for sure. A lot of variety. There's a lot of talent and a lot of ability and capabilities and possibilities and weaknesses and things you got to deal with. And we find out we're not nice, neat cubes. There's odd shapes in the middle of that. And you know what? I love your odd shapes. I really do. Because this is where we find that we connect in deeper ways, more meaningful ways. And people say, well, if we get into that, will we fit together? Yeah, we'll fit together. Maybe in a stronger way, a more beautiful way, a complex way for sure. But I love the way that you can fit together with the entirety of your lives. This is where we're really opening ourselves up. This is where, like family, I know you on your best days. I know you on the days where you present yourselves and we're all made up and we're in our Sunday best right now. But we also know each other on Tuesday when life is really rough, man. We also know each other on those Thursday mornings where maybe our family is not sticking together close, but we got to be there for one another. We know each other on our worst days. Yet now we're getting into the real mix of things, and we've got to fit together in the midst of that. And when we help each other through the midst of that, we lift each other up, and we do it in a Christian way, ooh, we've got that strength. Ooh, we start looking like the church of the first century. And when we move together in the direction God wants us to, it's something truly special when we open up to it. Some of you that are very visual may look at this picture and go like, well, Dave, I I get where you're going with this, but those two objects in the background, they're not going to fit perfectly in that cube. Yeah, I know. And I love that. I love it. I love it. Here's why. If you put the X-shaped one in there, it's going to leave some open spaces. And if you put the long blue strip in there as well, it's going to leave some spaces. But isn't that the church? To have space for more shapes to come in, to fill up, to grow and to always include those that are shaped after Christ. And wouldn't we invite that in? And wouldn't we want to develop that? Isn't that an element we saw in the first century church as well? To go from 120 to 3,000, that left a lot of open space. And to go from 3,000 to 5,000, and 5,000 and on and on and on. And sure, sadly, some, some of those pieces were lost, but many more were gained. But they continually function in a beautiful way, drawing closer to the Lord. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing that we get to be a part of. Citizens together in the household of God. Before we close out here, because I know we've, we've got time, I just want you to go back and consider Colossians chapter 3. 
We're not going to have time to dive into this right now, but write it down. It was the scripture reading that Chris read for us, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And what I want you to do when you read this, because sometimes we read this, and we particularly go to Colossians 3, and we look at verse 16, and we talk about music and singing and things there. But I want you to look at the whole passage. Because even in the singing part where we're teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, it's a together thing in harmony, which is really what he's getting at here. In fact, when you look through each of the verses, you can see there's an element of coming together, of standing together just in these six short verses. He calls you the elect of God in the, in the first one, those verse 12. He says to bear one another and forgive one another. There's that togetherness in there in the next verse. You have the bond of perfection, which is love, he gives in verse 14. Verse 15, he says, you're called to be one body. You teach and admonish, as I just said in verse 16. And then in verse 17, there's this sense that even together, everything that you do, together, do it all in the name of Jesus. There's a real sense of together. And he tells you how to do it as well as you go and read through that. And you may take a picture of this and you may study it. But I would ask you as you look at these things, when he says put on tender mercies and put on kindness and put on humility and meekness and long suffering, give it some life. Give it some color. These are not simply things that you just check off and do and say, I've got it done. And these aren't also just one thing you do and you, you pick one of those six verses and say, I'll, I'll just do that one and that'll be my thing. It's all of it. You're multifaceted people. God has given you a, a lot of depth and a lot of possibility, so it's all of it. We've got to learn to stand together and fit together with all of it, bearing and forgiving, loving for sure, letting the peace of God rule our hearts, and that directs us, letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom, and doing everything in the name of Jesus. Man, that's the church. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. No matter what the world may say about us, I know what God says about us, and that's what matters most. No matter what the world says we're worth, I know how much Jesus said we're worth as He died for our sins. And no matter what other people may say our purpose is, I know what the Scripture says our purpose is. And when we walk in that, we walk true. And when we stand together in that, there's not a thing we can't overcome. There's not a purpose we cannot accomplish if it's in the Lord. Be thankful you're part of the church. Be committed to the Lord's church. And be determined to make it as best as you possibly can. One flower by itself, interesting. But a collection of them all together makes a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let's be the beauty of the church. Today you may not yet be a part of the church, but you know that you can be. If Jesus died for one, He died for all. The Bible says He did. And if you have sins today that's holding you back, be free. Be free. That's the invitation that we offer, freedom. Freedom from your sin, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom. Freedom in Jesus. If you've heard the Word and you believe it, if you have your faith in it and you're willing to repent and turn to Christ, that's a wise choice to make. If you're willing to see that Christ in the Scripture is the Son of the living God and you're willing to commit to Him as your Lord and as your King, what an amazing thing to do. If you're willing in faith to be baptized, to have your sins washed away, why would you hesitate to be free from your sins? If you're willing to commit to the church, let today be that day. Do not hesitate. If there's a thing that we can do for you, come forward as we stand and as we sing.